I'm Jonathan Rogers. I am glad to be back at Alleluia. I was here two years ago speaking on student choir uh, ministry. And I, I love it. I've been able to do it, at, but at that point I've been doing it about 10 years or so. And I've taken a break kind of throughout that time. I've been teaching full time at Lee University in Cleveland, Tennessee. But this summer, after the Lord kind of has worked a crazy move in our life, we are back in ministry. And I'm back at a church where I used to serve in Birmingham, Alabama, Hunter Street Baptist Church. Uh, I've just been in the office a couple weeks <laughs> uh, and getting re-established there. Um, and it was at this church over, what, 12 years ago that I first started work with students, no, 13 years ago, started work with student choirs, uh, youth choirs, and you're gonna hear me use those interchangeably. I use student choirs. Hey, how's it going? Coming in. Um, did you? Well, that did. That's okay. No problem. What's your name? I'm Stuart. Hey, Stuart, welcome. Um, or I first really got immersed into this world, um, and it really just kind of captivated me. Being away from it for a while, I'm excited about being back with it now in this uh, new ministry location. One thing that really has inspired me about Student Choir is the opportunity to help students connect uh, with each other, with myself, and then with music, and ultimately with God. This topic, I've, I've presented this session in other arenas, not religious settings. Uh, I've, I've made some tweaks to it. But I call it the missing link. Sometimes there's, I feel, a missing link in what we go about doing in our work with student choirs. And it's a powerful, powerful link. And it is this idea of creating connections. The teaching minister wants to be thinking about it. The teaching director needs to always be thinking about how to make connections. That is how we learn the best. There's connecting to previously a previous body of knowledge, right? That's the educators tell us that's the best way that students learn things and that it stays with them. And it's called, uh, they attach it to something they already know. So this idea of creating connections is in our thinking. But how do we make connections with each other? And if you looked around the world any of these days, we are becoming increasingly disconnected through a false sense of connection based in technology. We think we're connected, but we're really not. So the value of meaningful connection, in my view, is going up like gold bullion. It's getting more and inc increasingly more valuable if you can create experiences and opportunities for kids to connect with each other, with you. And we're going to look at some research in this um, session that talks, that, that shows this, that really proves this, a, a really great... A uh, book I've referenced before in some sessions, and I, I hope you find it to be uh, helpful. Again, some some really good research-based nuggets here that I think are going to inform your practice and your approach. Might make you a little bit uncomfortable, maybe at times, in the way you've been doing things. It has made that for me. That has certainly been the case. <laughs> when was the last time you saw a group of teenagers, <laughs> and this was the scene? Minutes ago. Yeah. Minutes ago. Always, Always right? It, it's all, and these are helpful tools, but they're also incredibly big distractions, right? When other things that we want to focus on need to take the forefront. One of the questions, or some of the questions, I want us to think about to kind of guide your thinking, my presentation here. I'm going to pop a few up here. Is it important or necessary that students connect or engage with each other in some more meaningful ways? The title in the book said non-musical. Come on in, folks. Good to see you. Feel free to come on up front and get a seat. There's a handout there for you. Thanks for coming this afternoon. It's a great turnout. We, we just ran out. Okay. You, oh, I've got more. Hold on. Oh, me of, me of little faith. Okay. <laughs> Somehow I grabbed two. You need more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, me, of, me of extra faith. Extra faith. <laughs> extra yeah. Diligence. That's right. Um, 
It's important to connect. Yes, important to connect. Uh, how do we get oh, the session topic, non-musical, and I say this word, extra musical. We're going to connect, I, we'll talk about some ways that we can help our students connect to the music. But I want to think about the ways that are all non-musical, that are outside, extra musical, okay? Another question you could ask a little differently. Is it important or necessary that students connect or engage with you as their director, minister, teacher, whatever you want to call yourself? Why is that the case? And in what ways? We don't have to answer these out loud right now. Let's spark some thought. Other questions. Describe a time when you or your students struggled to make a connection with members in the musical ensemble or maybe in the music itself. Maybe you have something in your mind for that. Or describe a time when you or your students experienced a great sense of connectivity among other members in the musical ensemble, the music itself, or with you. And then what was the difference in those? Any and all of this is fair game. I'll refresh your mind here or here. Before I ask you to now speak, would you please raise your hand if you currently have a student choir or youth choir in your direction? Anyone? Okay, great. Awesome. All right, I open the floor. Anyone fire away? Within the context of um, the ensemble itself, within the members, Sorry. Um, you know, based on the demographic of every church that's represented in here, um, there are certain um, parameters, landscape divisions of, of students, I would, I would think. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I've been in this work uh, almost 40 years, and uh, 30 of those 40 um, were Sunday morning service youth choirs uh, every week um, to uh, come to a place where it, it had been through uh, a, a rebuilding time and certainly a, a desolate time. So it's the the connection within members of the ensemble. I think that's. It's the first time after my doing this four decades that we're seeing a distinction within the student ministry. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've never experienced that before. Mm -hmm. and it's uh, kind of a first. So When you say distinction, what, is, what, is yeah. what, do, you, what do you mean? Distinction by between students uh, who are actively involved in the whole of the church mm -hmm. and students who are part of the student ministry are very periphery within the context yeah, yes, of the life of the yeah, church. Yes. And so what we have is the larger number of students that attend our ministry do not attend all aspects of the life of the church. Mm -hmm. So the core students are the ones that are on Sunday mornings, Wednesday nights, mm -hmm. Sunday afternoons. But there's a larger influence that has been growing in the life of the church that is more periphery. But it's actually more influential, even though it's less involved into the life of the church. Yeah. I see what you mean. I think of it, uh, one thing that, that comes to mind, loosely connected to that, is I think in all our churches we can identify these various uh, levels or the kind of spheres. Kind of you have your, we you think, the people that fit in this that are attendees, maybe they're on the fringes, and you've got members inside this circle, and then even more in the center, you have your core membership and everything. You can only have another circle inside of that, right? And I think the goal here, I'm trying, you know, that you're sort of mentioning is that there's a body that fits in one of these circles that's, that's grown. Maybe, is that right? Kind of the, on the, the fringes a little bit, right. but it's still very important. And my thought has always been, how do we move folks from the edges to the center? Correct. Right, and I think that's a very important question to ask: is how do we help by making connections? We're helping move some folks from outer rings slowly further into more inner rings to that to, to being that more core. Not everybody's going to fit in. We understand, we know that, but the, our hopefully our process is helping us 
do that. I think if we can think in these terms. Other thoughts? Anyone want to share something? <clears throat> I think tradition connects students to each other, mm. to the legacy that they have, and even to the music. Yes. There are certain things that my kids have decided this is something that we want to do every year. There's a few things that are important to them. And that connects them to the to one another, to that song, its legacy and it brings. Uh -huh. So that's a great way to, to build that bridge. It's great how the music just kicked in. Uh, <laughs> Very traditional. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll take number two, and that's we did a uh, cantata, and uh, we brought in the youth choir to sing with the adult choir, and once they realized they knew the music better than many of the adult choir, uh -oh, it yes. was interesting to see them take on a leadership role. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Very good. Ken Meadema came and he did the whole evening, but we all learned, and even they led the youth choir to some of their own solos and parts within it, and in the children's parts also. So it was a multi generational evening. They felt a big part. Let's think about different types of connections. And in your handout, you can make some notes. I have other handouts in my sessions, there's a lot of blanks. Uh, my first one this morning through there, you know, there's a lot of blanks to fill in. Try to help keep folks engaged. Write what you want down. Um, there's no really, I mean, there's a few there, but there's no, the blank police is not going to come out and get you. I had a pastor who always talked about the blank police and he skipped out filling in the blank on the sermon outline in the bulletin. You know, a couple of connections that come to mind the physical connection that is, we're just in the same room, right? We're rubbing shoulders with one another. This is increasingly important to me as I see students not know how to stand around each other and be okay with what we call closing proximity. They get very uncomfortable. Proximity in teaching is a very important piece. You change proximity and learning shifts a little bit for how closer you get or further you get from a student, right? So when they get in proximity, there, I mean, there's interaction, but maybe less, and it's more about that, that picture that we saw back at the beginning, right? Just getting them in the room and rubbing shoulders, sitting next to each other in a chair, holding a folder of music or whatever it is, and rubbing shoulders, or sitting on the bus and traveling for eight hours, you know? These, these kinds of things are, are good connections, and I just want to mention it because it's easy to overlook it, but I think it increasingly helps in our current state to combat some of the siloing that our students are kind of living in, right? They're, they're connected across y'all with their phone. They can talk to somebody in China in their bedroom, and you would know no difference. So they think they're connected, but then have that person from China sit right next to them and have to have a conversation. That changes everything, right? That physicality is important, okay? Number two, we're hoping to make mental or intellectual connections. We want them to be thinking people. We want them to be thinking about the words that they are saying. We want them to be thinking or singing. We want them to be thinking about what it is we're trying to do, thinking about our mission if we're going on tour if we're traveling or whatever it is, if we're singing in worship, be thinking about how they're standing, right? We want them to be thinking about how should they sound right now, some musical th things that they should be thinking about. There's a whole host of things. We want them to be thinking, oh, this idea, this scripture text, oh, we're singing it right here. Oh, yeah, this is from this book. Oh, this is about, you know, this is about this theological idea. This talks about faith, or this talks about the trinity, or this talks about mercy, or grace, whatever, right? We want to be making them, helping them make connections with their mind as well. We also know we're working with teenagers, but we're also, we're dealing with people, and we want to work with the whole person, as I'm going to mention in a minute. Connecting with them emotionally, I think, is really, really important. Music, uh, Robert Shaw says this quote, I like this, music is the voice of the spirit, the voice of the spirit. Very, very good. Weston Noble has a book, uh, long, long time director at Luther College. Uh, he talks about 
the vulnerability in music making, and there's this kind of shadow side of us that uh, comes through, and it's that emotional side that, that a student or a person might not feel comfortable sharing, but in, in say conversation, but within a context of making music or within the context of an ensemble, suddenly the ability to be vulnerable is easier, right? And exposing or engaging them at an emotional level. Listen to this quote. This is, uh, I think this speaks kind of to where we're going with this idea. This uh, concept is tactfulness in teaching. This is from a book I'll show you, it'll come up in a minute, by Tom Barone called Touching Eternity. Very good book. Tactfulness means touching, touching someone, rousing them from slumber into a greater personal awareness while respecting and preserving their personal space. This kind of tactfulness can bring coherence to the scattered pieces of a self. I know several teenagers who probably feel very scattered in themselves. It helps prompt the construction of a more integrated worldview and thereby encourage personal growth. A seed planted by an act of tactfulness may itself lie dormant within the consciousness of the student, with growth and learning serendipitously as a propitious moment years hence. That's very heavy, that's very wordy, but it's really strong. Right? Going back here, this idea of connecting a greater personal awareness, awakening and uh, engaging the whole person. And that is important that we do that with the, uh, with, uh, at the emotional level. Another comment on this, Barone's teacher, this is from James Jordan, uh, who teaches at Westminster Choir College, is very pro and big on Tom Barone's book, and he talks about this in other ways, and so I'm quoting Tom Barone, but it's in Jordan's book. Anyway, Barone, and Jordan, uh, Jordan says, Barone's teacher recruited them into his program to equip them with additional resources for maintaining an internal, listen to this, it's so interesting to me, an internal aesthetic playground for guarding the silence of their secret places against the noise distractions of larger culture. Rehearsal must cajole or force singers into that playground, that internal aesthetic playground, where they have found all the secret places they are, they have arms, sorry, that's from that they have already experienced. That sounds really heady and you think, I'm dealing with seventh through twelfth graders, to which I say, Yes, you're dealing with seventh through twelfth graders who are increasingly emotional. Or incredibly emotional. They're most emotionally, emotionally visceral at any time in their life. Right? But calling, because these secret places, folks, are there. They are a master of that age of hiding them, of separating them, of protecting them, because that's a place where they feel safe. You might not know it. If we engage them at that emotional level, we start to open the door a little bit there. Of course, teenagers are social, relational. We all are, but they're especially social and relational beings. A quote here just to kind of inspire you as you think about that point of connection. Parker Palmer, we know Parker Palmer, um, his book, A Hidden Hole, is he says, community does not necessarily mean living face to face with others, rather it means never losing the awareness that we are connected to each other. It is not about the presence of other people, it is about being fully open to the reality of relationship whether or not we are actually alone. He goes on, of course, solitude is essential to personal integration. There are places in the landscapes of our lives where no one can accompany us because we are communal creatures who need each other's support and because, left to our own devices, we have an endless capacity for self-absorption <laughs> and self-deception. Community is equally essential to rejoining soul and role. I love that. We're talking about this idea of socially and relationally connecting, that community, that community aspect that is a part, can be a part of the choral experience. Of course, musical connections, yes? Um, this quote, I don't think I put it, oh, I did put it up here. 
in Weston Noble's book I referenced a minute ago. Leonard Bernstein said in the Young People's Concerts from 1958, by the way, if you don't know much about those or see any of those, go watch some YouTube videos where Leonard uh, where Bernstein teaches through these Young People's Concerts. It's fascinating, fascinating the way he explains things. There's no limit to the different kinds of feelings music can make you have. Every once in a while, we have feelings so deep and so special that we have no words for them. And that's where music is so marvelous, because music names them for us only in note instead of words. That kind of musical connection is possible in the choral experience. It doesn't have to, it sounds so mountaintopish, right? But it can be just the most simplest of ideas, simplest of connections that may happen in your uh, choir. And of course, in our world, the spiritual connection. We are using music to do what is the greatest thing, and that is a tool to connect our people, to connect us, our students, with the divine, right? To sing great words that bring worship to him, that encourage others to worship him, and that teach our singers something about God, about Jesus, the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. There's so much that music can teach at a spiritual level. And of course, Colossians 3.16, the word, of, the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. Teaching and admonishing, there it is. Sing, how do we do that? By singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and listening your hearts to God. You may, that's a scary picture, but you might not know who that is. That's Helen Kim, famed children's choir director. And her quote that many of you probably know really kind of sums this up. These connections that we're trying to strive for help us create and minister to the whole person. And she's known for this quote, body, physical, mind, mental, spirit, spiritual, voice, also physical. It takes the whole person to sing and rejoice. I like that. It's very short, but man, that's a powerful statement. And so by thinking about creating connections, helping our students create connections, and just being mindful of what it is we're trying to do, I asked in our lunch today a big question. What are you trying to accomplish? In every context, that can look differently. For me, this is one of the top bullet points, is making those different kinds of connections. It's not going to happen in one rehearsal. It might not happen in a month. But hopefully over the course of a year's work in ministry with your students, they sense and have made various kinds of connections. They might not even know that it happened, but you know you've been intentional about trying to make it happen. That's what's important. So, the question I had is there's some research to help us answer the questions that I've listed here. Why are these connections so important, especially for teenagers and, say, even college students? What actions or activities discourage or encourage this type of connectivity? And also, how can we as conductors, teachers, ministers, whatever, insert whatever word you call yourself, adjust our methods to foster these types of connections? And the answer is, of course, there is research. <laughs> I work backwards from that to this slide. Uh, and we're going to look at it. And I think it's really, really insightful. I've referenced this book before, and it's so very good. It's becoming, I hope he comes out with another edition. His first edition, this book called Hurt by Chap Clark, came in 2004. And then a second edition in 2011. There it is. Hurt 2.0 is the 2011 edition. Um, Chap Clark is the Associate Provost for Strategic Projects and Professor and Chair of Youth and Culture Department in the School of Theology at um, in the, let's see, the Polar Seminary, sorry. What he has done in this book, uh, he has attempted an honest look at the American teenager from the inside perspective of their world. He's gone into their world and conducted this incredible qualitative research study, studying the life of what he calls the mid-adolescent, ages 14 to 20. It took place at a high school, very prominent high school in Los Angeles. It was what he called, it's called an ethnographic study. That means he lived in their world. He didn't just send them a survey and expect responses, but he went and lived among them, interviewed them, talked to them, walked with them, went to their classes, went to their games, events, blah, blah, blah. He just lived in their world. 
The idea is that the social research that he was undertaking was a very interactive process. He wasn't looking at trying to control outcomes or produce outcomes. He just wanted to see what he was going to find and lived among them. In this book, he examines a ton of issues. A few of them, and they're chapters just on busyness, sexuality, athletics, school, family, and on and on. Uh, at this school is a very widely diverse ethnic population, big in sports, music, drama, very active school, one of these blue ribbon schools. The mean population uh, of middle class, it was middle class and uh, was extremely widely diverse, even economically. Um, so, some things that come out from this, from Dr. Clark, he talks, he, he gives this quote from a, in the book from a junior. This is interesting. In this book, tell them our story. Tell them the truth that nobody cares, that nobody listens, that teachers and coaches and cops and parents don't even know who we are. Tell them that and see if anybody listens. Ha, huh. not a chance. You might say, well, that's not my student. Not much has really changed in adolescence since I was a teenager. Have you ever, I'm curious if anyone's ever caught, don't answer, if you've ever caught yourself saying that. I have before. You think adolescents are like they've always been, but I think there are some things that have definitely changed. It's not so to them, but the cultural context they've been in, have, they are in, has changed, and how they view connectivity is very different. The student says, most of our Clark says, I'm sorry, most of us want to take the easy route of claiming that adolescence hasn't changed since we were in high school. Others say it really doesn't matter if adults understand kids, as long as the young live up to adult values of respect, commitment, and hard work. Still, others fall into the category, if you can't understand them, join them. After years of studying and conversations with countless adults, there is a gnawing, nagging reality that even though we may want to be committed to being a light to our young, we have no idea who or what we are dealing with. Don't answer out loud, but sometimes you may feel that way. I, even at 37, sometimes feel that way. Things are changing. The students I saw when I first started teaching at Lee and the end when I left it five years later were different on the whole. They were different kinds of kids. Char uh, Clark goes on. I concluded that good adolescence is a new, understudied element of the adolescent process and journey. Unlike at any other stage of life, mid-adolescence is a world of multiple selves. Mid-adolescents are not able to compartmentalize themselves while operating out of a personal sense of self. Society has let go of personal and individual commitment to the young. Therefore, during mid-adolescence, they find themselves forced to function out of multiple selves. The reality that he is trying to get us to see is that we need to understand our students so that we can care for them more effectively. That is the bottom line. When we think about the multiple selves of adolescence, we should be thinking, how can we help this person? Going back to the previous thing we talked about, how can we help them be more unified? Right? What did Helen Kim say? Body, mind, spirit, voice. The whole person to sing and rejoice. See what we have the potential to start maybe doing and the impact we can have. Uh, so the question we must be asking, how can we help the students engage and connect with music, with each other, and with us as directors? The premise of his book, the key contributor to the current state of your teenagers, of mid-adolescents, is what he calls the culture of abandonment. That's harsh, that's strong, this is going to feel negative. I said this morning, maybe Debbie Downer, but there is light at the tunnel, end of the tunnel, I promise. You're going to see a lot of quotes up here, so hang on. If we have to stand up and do jumping jacks so we don't have the post-lunch fade, we'll do that, okay? The so Dr. Pepper floats are on their way, okay. He says, adolescents have been cut off far too long from the adults who have the power and experience to escort them in, I love that visual, into the greater society. Adolescents have been abandoned. They have therefore created their own world, a world that is designed to uh, protect them from the destructive forces and wilds of the adult community. On the surface, we'll see a reaction by mid adolescents to avoid, to avoid deep, meaningful connections. That's important. This is him talking. For fear of harm, abuse, neglect. 
neglect or perceived lack of long-term value. So if we're gonna engage and help students make connections, we must first be engaged and connected with them and into their world. Clark comes up with several, uh, with three conclusions out of this whole book. I'm just giving you the really big highlights here. Here's his first conclusion. Mid-adolescence, after all he studied, all the interviews, all the research, this is what it came down to. Number one, he found mid-adolescents desire meaningful relationships with other mid-adolescents. Quotes here for you. Traditional theories of development affirm that the shift from familial allegiance and intimacy to peer affiliation and commitment is a normal process during adolescence. Few would argue against the necessity for intimate peer relationships during, middle, during adolescence, for they are important uh, and important for social skill development. As contemporary theorists and research attempt to describe and codify the changes in adolescent development, they recognize that relationships are a, if not the, vital issue, and an even more significant driving force for clustering, that is grouping of students, we know it as cliques. Clustering today is the need to find a safe place. In short, clusters develop because mid-adolescents know they have no choice but to find a safe, supportive family and community, and in a culture of abandonment, the peer group seems to be the only option they have. So, they desire. This is not necessarily brand new information for you, but I'm saying after all this research, number one, what was confirmed, they do want to be connected with other students. Number two, mid-adolescents desire meaningful relationships with adults. Some of the quotes. Building a bridge between adults and adult-run systems. You've never seen this before, have you? This picture here. Okay. Uh, structures, organization, and institution is not enough to bring vital healing to the wounded psyches of adolescents. Each individual, by the time he or she is a mid-adolescent, this is important to me, needs to know that at least one adult knows him or her well and will do whatever it takes to bring him or her into the community of healthy adulthood. For some of you, you could be that person. Depending on their family situation, you might be that person, whether you know it or not. Conclusion number three. <coughs> Excuse me. Mid-adolescents desire community and want to know that they are connected. And these are chaps' words, just so you know. Connected to something bigger than themselves, a place to make a meaningful contribution. Big quote here. The striking thing is that the systems that are present to serve mid-adolescents are almost universally locked into serving an, an adolescent community that is more or less cohesive. School assumes community, thus the perpetuation of identity formed in classes. Coaches rely on students' willingness and ability to work as a team. Even the church tries to bring young people from a wide variety of schools and clusters into what they call fellowship. Right. Good old fellowship. He goes on. Today's teenagers, this is interesting, are thrown into false relationships by adults who think kids connect with one another just like they used to. Teens will perform as necessary to fulfill the roles they have been cast to play, but for many, how they appear on the outside is far different from the driving sense of place and home they crave on the inside. That's a lot, but Clark doesn't leave us with nothing to do. He gives us some very practical action points. I'm going to give those to you out of this book as well. Number one, youth need a stable and secure loving presence. They need a stable and secure loving presence. Here's a quote for you, driving this idea home. Mid-adolescents seem impenetrable callous and without a need for adults. This is not a smoke screen. It is an authentic depiction of how they have chosen to cope with the dangers posed by abandonment by those they have trusted. Adults should not be fooled by the reactions or even the words of adolescents. They should trust that each one, this is important, is desperate for a safe and secure loving presence regardless of whether or not they know it. Action point number two. Youth need to experience authentic, meaningful relationships with adults. 
This cannot be stressed enough. Long quote here for you. Yet the fact remains that every child needs authentic, intimate relationships with adults until he or she has completed much of the adolescent process. This responsibility cannot fall to parents alone or to teachers who can touch individual students for a year at best. The only way we can stem the tide of the consequences of abandonment is to encourage a wide variety of adults to take part in the lives of the young. Nothing else will make a difference, not more baseball fields, more programs and events, or more job opportunities. Because the root of the issues related to contemporary adolescence has to do with leaving this age group to flounder on its own. The answer is relationships with adults who sincerely care. That is the sole need of this abandoned generation. If I asked you how many of your students could name five members in your church who are above the age of 70 that aren't grandparents, could they do it? And when's the last time they have been in a community fellowship of some sort, even if it's around the table or a reception or snack time or something? Could a student do that? That's really important. That's extreme to say seven. <coughs> Just lower it. Say 40. And it's not their parents, right? Could they name five people that they know they feel like are they connected with and that are invested in them as an individual? That's a very convicting question, friends. I say that personally. Third action point. Youth need refocused nurturing organizations and programs. Well, here, across our nation, in villages, towns, and even cities, adults and children celebrated life together. He's looking backwards for a minute. They ate together, danced together, and played together. Little children were scolded by merchants who often played the role of a relative. A teenager considering college was the talk of the barber shop. An invitation to a state band. Oh, let's see, I'm adding things here that you don't see. <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'm going to keep going. An invitation to a state band concert, a bad case of the chicken pox, or a home run at a county softball tournament captivated the interest of an entire community. Everyone mattered, and that included teenagers, even though they were still a few years removed from full adult status. The benefits of this tribal connection are obvious, especially in light of how far we have drifted. Adults knew their responsibility to nurture and protect the young, and therefore held fast, realizing that the young were their most precious resource. They even started activities uh, and programs intended to organize communal nurture of the young. Today, that kind of community, especially in terms of how adolescents are viewed, is all but lost. The young of every village, town, and city in America are in need of the same thing, a community of people, organizations, institutions that have their individual needs and interests in mind. So what does this all mean for us? It's a lot. Very simple. This choral ensemble, student choir, whatever you want to call it, can be a place of community. Something you already have sensed and know. Meaningful relationships and be a place of connections where all three of those action points take place in one thing. One thing. We must be intentional. We must be systematic about engaging our students on multiple levels and creating a sense of community and belonging. We do this by fostering meaningful connections with peers, adults, and music. Um, how are we doing on time? I'm going to skip this. <clears throat> For a minute, can some of you take, a, take, take 30 seconds here, think back to your time in a choir, think back to just, do you have a memory that kind of comes to you as being just one of your most cherished memories from being in a choir or singing at an earlier time in your life? If it was when you were a teenager, that's certainly applicable. Who's got something? Go ahead. Sure. So I'm here because when I was in junior high, I auditioned for high school choir. And in that rehearsal, the high school choir director, who I had only met on occasion, looked at me and said, I believe you have tremendous potential. I'm going to put you in the choir. That's it. Wow. Right there. One time. Life changed. And all three of those things happened. I grew up really poor, forced family, broken home, moved around a lot. 
this is that one instance wow. where God started changing my life. And I don't want to step out here not knowing who uh, this person, um, but that that could have been. I've said stuff I think in passing sometimes, and I never know what's he, going he to be grabbed. And I, I would venture to say, I wonder if he knew just that, if it was very fleeting, if it was just kind of passing. And not that it wasn't sincere, yeah. but the sheer impact, something that quick for, for that statement made. That's amazing. That's great. Anyone else? A quick story. Michael Burkhardt just talked about a kid uh, who had been on 10 years ago, 15 years ago. He uh, let play the organ with him in front of the uh, congregation. Oh, cool. And the kid, uh, he just saw him this year, a couple weeks ago, and he just got his uh, master's in organ. Wow. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you're going to play the organ in a church? He said, no, I'm going to become a doctor. So, I mean, the kid just, from that one incident, that was the first time he ever played the organ. Uh. Because he's still going to play. Yeah. He's going to go on and do even more. Yeah. Wow. Someone else? I would say also that it doesn't necessarily have to be musical, but a memory um, from just maybe being in a musical ensemble, even though it might not be a musical thing. I think of always the, uh, the wonderful role that that community plays in times of uh, bereavement and yes. loss and illness. Uh, so many times I can envision uh, youth choir. My father was a minister of music. We had several tragic losses of life, and uh, you know these choirs would come together and not only sing for these funeral services, you know, but mm -hmm. with, with fellowship together uh, as part of that coping with that loss. It was a huge, massive resource uh, for parents of students and students themselves. It just became, you know, that, that real uh, embryonic kind of thing that <laughs> you felt like you were in the womb uh, yeah. uh, with one another. Uh, so those, I, re I recall those, those times were great, great strength. I can think back instantaneous to the anthems we were singing and mm -hmm. And how we drew an eternal peace from that yeah. kind of thing. It's unlike any other resource for a student. Yeah. Anyone else? Well, let's talk now a little more, maybe enjoy a little quieter. How do we do this? How do we create connections? What are some things we can do? I think of this in two ways. You want to keep going in the handout. And this is something that's just, I put it all there for you, typed it out, whatever, so you can have this and refer back to some ideas here. You'll see on page, let's see, page two and then page three, at the top is a heading. One of them, the first I think, should say shared environment. We create connections, and I think of this in two ways. By creating a shared environment. Uh, we are thinking in terms of that environment. That is where this process takes place. The process of student choir. Day in and day out rehearsals, touring, whatever it is, singing in worship. Uh, singing out, serving, doing ministry, the process of doing that. There's an environment where we are cooking, right? We have put all the ingredients together, we're mixing, we're baking, we put it in the oven. But then there's the other side of it where we're also providing shared experiences. You can think of this as the product mentality. What is it that actually comes out of the oven, okay, from that cooking process? Uh, and there's ways to create connections that influence these two areas as I see it. Uh, and that's all you have there on, that, uh, on your handout are a bunch of ideas that borrow from different people, things I've done, things I've heard that people do, just a whole, pretty much a list of a bag of tricks, okay, that you can think about. So let's look at it really quickly. Uh, some of this has been adapted from a book that many of you probably know if you don't. You should know about it. Uh, we've already talked about Hurt 2.0. 
Randy Edwards' book, Revealing Riches, Building Lives, a fabulous resource for youth choir ministry. If you not, uh, don't have that, it's just a great, quick, you can find all sorts of stuff in there. I've put other resources out there for you. One, and I'm not going to mention this, or it's not up on the screen. There is a book called Sticky Faith that's out on the table, and this is a great resource for helping students engage their faith. Okay, this is kind of, this that really connects to what sort of we're talking about here. Uh, another book we put out, is a, I put out there, uh, is a book, um, what's it called, I, uh, Gen Z, it's an orange, it talks about Generation Z, which are the kids that are in your choir, by the way. Uh, anyone generally accepted as being born after 2000. So if you have a choir, 6 through 12, they are born in 2000 to 2006. So knowing Gen Z, that's who you're doing. You're not dealing with millennials anymore. I'm a millennial, some of you in here are millennials. But your kids you're working with right now are not. Some of the college students I was working with, they're millennials. We're a different generation. And knowing more about the people that are in the seats is going to be crucial for you in helping these connections happen. There's another book um, called Do Hard Things by the Harris Brothers. Uh, a great book with amazing stories about mid-adolescents, about teenagers doing amazing things like getting a team of t together to raise money and go build water wells in Africa. Teenagers. 16 and 17, they're out there doing hard things, like the impact, and there's been people, adults, who've spoken into their lives that, that this, is the, this is what's being reaped from that kind of sowing. So it's a really amazing story, very inspiring. So anyway, this is a few resources I've been meaning to mention. Uh, let's see, let's look at the sheet here. Look at the side that says shared environment, or you can say atmosphere. Read through this list uh, just on your own for a minute. And I want you to somebody fire out something that you've never thought of before or something that's kind of intriguing to you. If you pulled one of these or two of these to incorporate at some point in your year, I think you could find some things. There's some really practical things. There's some mindset things. Something like, you know, being vulnerable. Vulnerability is huge. But just kind of read over that and see anything that jumps out to you. I want to hear what you think there. <laughs> and if you have a question about something that you want me to elaborate on, please mention that too. Yes. And so they think of failure as, as you know, I have failed rather than as a step in learning. Mm -hmm. And and learning that, especially in music, you're not going to do something well the first time you try to do it. It's going to take right. some discipline and practice. And so yeah. admitting where you've fallen down, where you have this problem, I like I like that to yeah. help them. This this phrase I had a student mention in a devotion she was leading in my car one time. A women's choir. And this is very perceptive on her part. She talked about being free to fail. Mm -hmm. She hit it on the head for many of those students. They have not been free to fail. Yeah. They've lived in a culture and society that says perfection, and that's all they see on social media and news and whatever, you know. So giving themselves freedom to fail and then and something that maybe was a part of your leadership fails, you know, and because you're right, I'm telling you, in the five years I was at Lee, the counseling center numbers went skyrocketed. They are out of staff. They need more. Yeah. And I started seeing group, I'd never seen this before, and I could not believe what I was seeing. Our counseling resources are being, were being devoted to group therapy classes, and you know what the topic was? The word she said, resiliency. I said, 
Isn't that what you learn on the playground when you like skinny? Yeah, playing playground. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. <laughs> they don't play in the playground. Uh, you know, so things that we used to learn because of the experiences, our context, what I mentioned earlier, that informed how we responded to our culture, that whole context is different now. Okay, so therefore the response of our students to that culture is different, making them look different than adolescents have ever looked. Okay, very, very important. Other thoughts? Yeah. Yep. Uh, Related to that to a degree, uh, but yet we all know that great music is great music. Yes. And maybe within all of our choirs, 10, 20% of those students are capable of recognizing this is a great piece of music. Yep. But by doing all of this mm -hmm. and prioritizing all of this, yep. for the average students, the access to something being great music is through this first. That's right. 9% of their experiences, they're not there because yep. they're seeking great musical experiences, shaking vowels, yep. understanding intonation, tuning. Mm -hmm. There are things become great pieces of music because of all of this. That's exactly right. That's, it. that's right. And yeah. so that's how salient all of this is that you're talking about. I, I think it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was reading in this, particularly on this process portion that says, uh, uh, have them collaborate with you to even set parameters uh, for what the expectations are. Because what you said about the playground, well, their idea of what appropriate discipline is nowadays, it's way off the charts yeah. where we were. And yeah. so uh, it, it, for us to understand that, getting that collaboration from them is huge. I think. If you heard me say this, one who were in the session where it's a lunch discussion. I want to throw out that idea. I was with Tim Sharp uh, Monday at a state ACA thing, and he talked about this word, collaboration. What are you doing to collaborate? Not just among your choir, but other things. This is so important for the health and the future of the youth choir. And what he kind of carried us a little bit further is, we often think of this word. Our student choir is for students. Our student choir is for our community. And we plan our programming and our work is built with the four in mind. But what if we change that to this? Your programming and planning is with the idea of with. That is a very different place than for, right? It's for our students, it's for our families. But what if you've planned and worked and thought and dreamed and collaborated with them? with them in mind. It's not that there's no one in charge. That's not what we're saying. But that's a different mindset and it's approach. That informs your process very, very differently. A quick question here, because I want to get to the other one before we're out of time. Do you, someone can respond to one of two questions here. What are the challenges with trying to generate this kind of atmosphere? Some things that are on there like vulnerability, collaboration, student leadership, you know, teaching in different ways? Or what, what's the challenges, or do you have any fears about that? And that's okay to be honest about that. Anyone want to say anything about that? Well, it's got to be real. Yeah. Or if it's not real, it'll pick up on the way. Absolutely. Out before you can keep going. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess the fear is that it's not perceived as real. Yeah. Because it's so out of touch. Yeah. And the difference in maturity within the group. Mm -hmm. That's that's where I had challenges with vulnerability and this, that, and the other is some of them were ready for that and some of them were not. Mm -hmm. And responded very maturely to it. So yeah. then it becomes not a safe place. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very true. One thing I just put my eyes on was this idea of consistent and fair discipline. discipline. That's almost becoming a four letter word in our society. Anyone else feel that way? It's discipline mm -hmm. or the idea of rules or guidelines or things. And but what you need to know is that's the thing that's not changed about students. One of them is that they crave boundaries. Mm -hmm. Because friends, I'm telling you, you might be the only place that gives them boundaries in your choir rehearsal room. They might have no boundaries anywhere else. Schools are becoming increasingly limited on what kind of boundaries they can set for fear of a whole host of things, whether it be litigation or parental you know, mania and, and problems, you know? 
Mm -hmm. Consistency is key and fairness in that is, is really important. Even something little and practical though is personalized folders. That takes extra work, mm -hmm. but that shows that they're important. You know, it's got their name on it. I mean, just something as simple as that. You actually take the first rehearsal and let the kids do their own. I love it. I think that's great. <coughs> that's a great idea. Perfect. Yeah. Little things like sending notes and cards and letters or highlighting whoever did something. You gotta keep your ear to the ground, have somebody listening for when he has achievements of students at schools or wherever. But highlighting that in some way is really great. On the other page, the product, the creating connections through shared experiences. The first thing I want to say is work towards well rehearsed, prepared, and polishes, polished performances every time. Every time. Don't have a performance where you're hobbling, <laughs> where you're limping. That's hard, friends, I know that is hard. <laughs> but let that be the goal you're shooting for. Give them a great musical experience, as great as what they can do, okay? This, and we're not saying like they're singing shooting an S and G, but whatever it is they're singing, bet, have it be done so as well as you can, you know, as well as they can do it, okay? Other things you might consider there, I'll just kind of go through these quickly, the retreat weekend. That has been a game changer for my experience. How many of you do some sort of retreat with your choirs? Anyone? Yeah, I mean, there's so many ideas about how to do that. I mean, wow, you can you can find all sorts of things. Uh, Youth Q's got some good things uh, on uh, the website to different ideas. Wow, good stuff. Um, don't be afraid to be vulnerable. I call it rehearsal powwows. I know it's probably a little not PC anymore. But uh, being vulnerable about the music's teaching, what's being said, what does this make you think about? How is this text impacting your life right now? Trust me, if you don't answer the, ask that question, they ain't going to be thinking about it. <laughs> but if you ask that question and they still can't find an answer, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I guess I should be thinking, what does this have to do with me? Trust me, they're already thinking about that all the time, so why not leverage it to your benefit? <laughs> what's this have to do with me? Well, I'll tell you what this has to do with you if you don't know the answer to that, right? Make, help them make that connection. Um, the other things you can see, wow, would you ever find that student who could lead warm-ups? That's crazy <laughs> to think about. But why not try to work towards that? How about that would be fun? Tours and traveling experiences, um, anything that gets students looking outside of themselves. Number 13, they must interact and engage with someone else's reality. I put it that way. Out, they've got to get outside of their own reality. Other ideas there, number 16, Phil mentioned it, traditions. He was talking about these traditions that I look for. All that is good. Um, number 14. What did I say? Oh, the numbers are different. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, 11. What number was it? 14. 14, I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, conclusion here. I love this quote. Another Parker Palmer quote. Let's wrap up with this. Unfortunately, community in our culture often, too often means a group of people who go crashing through the woods together, scaring the soul away. In spaces ranging from congregations to classrooms, we preach and teach, assert and argue, claim and proclaim, admonish and advise, and generally behave in ways that drive everything original and wild into hiding. Under these conditions, the intellect, emotions, will, and ego may emerge, but not the soul. We scare off all soulful things, like respectful relationship, goodwill, and hope. Only he, and this is Martin Buber, I like this, who only he who himself turns to the other human being and opens himself to him receives the world in him. Only the being whose otherness, hang with it here, accepted by my being, lives and faces me and the whole compression of existence brings the radiance of eternity to me. Only when two say to, the, to one another with all that they are, it is, capital T, thou, is the indwelling of the present being, capitalized, between them. How revealing, how are we revealing God within each other to each other. That's pretty powerful. That's the connection that is the ultimate that we're searching for.